Welcome back to yet another episode of Chess TV. In this episode, Professor Arne Johansson will tell you more about the 1989's Harper's Weekly. Albert discusses Machiavelli's theory of power in a chess context, Alfred and Adriana analyze the game between Polomadiov and Gelfand, and then we also have a chess puzzle with a checkmate in three moves. But first, the Women's World Chess Cup 2012, which was organized by the Ugorian Chess Academy in Canton Mansis from November the 11th to December the 2nd, gathered the top 64 players in the world. First, they played six knockout rounds from of two games, which reduced the participants from 64 to 32, 16, 8, 4, and then 2. In the finale, the third former women's world champion, Antoineta Stefanova, was pitched against Anna Ushanina in four tough games. When the smoke had finally settled, Anna Ushanina was declared the winner and would get to play a match against current world champion Hu Yifang for the title. Congratulations and good luck! The London Chess Classics are finally here. Friday, November 30th was the opening of the fourth London Chess Classics, the strongest ever event in Britain. It started with some informal games, a press conference and ended with a Twitter game. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll get to see some of the world's top players battling it out in London, like Carlsen, Aronian and Kramnik, the three highest rated players in the world, world champion Anand and super grandmaster Judith Polgay. Visit LondonChessClassic.com to follow the event. The book Move First, Think Later by Willie Hendricks won the English Chess Federation's 2012 Book of the Year Award. Move First, Think Later is one of the most original chess books that judges have ever seen for a number of years, according to the Judges Report. The judges observed that the book, subtitled Sense and Nonsense in Improving Your Chess, contains a substance criticism of much of a traditional chess training and literature and praised the thought-provoking essays, the challenging chess exercises, and Hendrick's wit and sense of humor. Just something to maybe think about while shopping for Christmas gifts. The world champion Vishwanathan Anand, his most recent challenger Boris Gelfand, the former world champion Vladimir Kramnik, and the rising star Fabiano Caruana will be competing in the second series chess challenge from February 23rd to March 1st of 2013. They will face off each other in a double round robin tournament at the Savoy Hotel in Zurich. Following on from the 2012 Zurich Chess Challenge, which was a match between Kramnik and Levon Aronian, the main sponsor, Oleg Skvortsov, is making it possible for another highly attractive event to be staged by the Zurich Chess Club. The 2013 tournament marks the 60th anniversary of the legendary candidates tournament won by Vasily Smyslov and promises to be a highlight of the chess calendar. And now, everybody, it's time for Albert, so here we go. Machiavelli emphasizes the importance for a prince not to be hated. And he even says that if a prince successfully avoids the hate, he has fulfilled his duty. It's enough to just avoid hatred in order to keep the throne. But despite this, many leaders want to be loved. And if not for the exercise of power, then for other stuff too, like North Korea's former dictator Kim Jong-il, who wanted everyone to know that he's the best, strongest and smartest in every way and he even went as far as making up myths about himself. Like for example that he wrote poetry and operas and that he during his first golf match ever played no less than five hole-in-ones. But he did actually succeed quite well. When he passed away last year I saw TV reports of large crowds mourning him and crying hysterically. But as Machiavelli claims, it's enough to just not be hated. So how do you actually avoid the hate and despise as a prince? Well, you have to avoid appearing as fickle, frivolous, effeminate or masculine, I suppose, mean spirit and irresol irresolute. And instead, the prince should show greatness, courage, gravity and fortitude through his actions. Furthermore, a prince should, and this is important, keep away from stealing the possessions of his subjects. If a prince does this, he only has to control the hunger of power from a few, which isn't as difficult to do. But why care about avoiding hatred? 
Well, if the prince is not hated, it's quite hard to conspire against him. The conspirator will both have trouble finding allies, and he might also be discouraged to kill the prince if he fears that the people will be enraged. And even if the conspirator would have the courage to try, history shows us the importance of support from the people. Annibal, the prince of Boulogne, was killed by the family Kaneshi, who, and only one little child from Annibal's family survived. But since Annibal was liked in the city, the people rose and killed the entire Kaneshi family. Thereafter, they gave back the city to the little child who had survived. Machiavelli uses this example to show the importance of the people's support and their hatred. He also mentions that there are two threats a prince should take seriously, namely internal from the subject and the external from other princes. In chess, the threat from other princes is quite clear. We always play against an opponent. But there is also an in internal threat in chess. Playing with uncooperative and uncontrolled pieces is just as a dangerous a threat. With loyal subjects or cooperative pieces, it's no challenge to defend yourself against other princes or the opponent. So keep away from the hate, because if the people hate you, they will oppose you as soon as they get the chance. Welcome to the Opening School's last episode of the year, in which we've picked a game from the Fide Grand Prix tournament in Tashkent. The game was played in the seventh round between the Super Grandmasters Ruslan Ponomario from Ukraine and Israeli Boris Gelfand. There is a risk in chess of feeling limited by the opening stage of the game. You feel that you have to play a mainstream opening in order to even reach the mode game with an equal position. But since your opponents know theory at least as well as you do, all games lead to basically the same positions. In order to avoid this, players sometimes look into less well-known variations, hoping to capture their opponent off guard. Unfortunately though, there is usually a reason for a variation not being popular in the first place. They usually leave you at a disadvantage if the opponent manages to find the right moves. So it's really a question of of if you're willing to risk it and hope that the opponent will not know the exact correct continuation. It's certainly quite a bind, so what do you do, Alfred? Well, the trick is to avoid flashy openings, uh, because they often look, focus on looking good instead of actually being any good. This might sound strange, but the fact is that attacks are extremely hard to pull off. Not only do you need to coordinate all of your pieces, but you also need an accessible weakness that you can exploit. And there is, are not many of those if your opponent at least knows to some extent what he's doing. What you actually should do is very well illustrated in the, today's game. So let us take a look at it. Ponomaryov opened up by playing e4 against which Gelfand decided to play c5, leading us into the Sicilian defense, one of the most popular openings in the world. The game continued with knight to f3 and knight to c6, and if we think mainstream, we are somewhere in the middle of it right now. But this is where Ponomaryov decided to play bishop to b5 instead of the extremely common d4. Note that bishop to b5 is also quite popular. It is a simple move, but it takes you far off the course from what would have happened after d4. Now e6 followed, and then castle king side, knight to g to e7, rook to e1, and knight to d4. You can barely compare this line to the usual Sicilian. Instead of focusing on capturing the center as quickly as possible, followed by a lot of st stabilizing moves, white has chosen a rather solid development without weaknesses, but without any clear goals either. But that's not much of a problem, since the reason behind White's weak attack is that he simply has not developed his position yet. And the same goes for Black, of course. After this, White exchanged knights on d4, followed by c3. Alfred, what should Black do here? 
Well, uh, you might be tempted to exchange on c3, especially since the pawn on d4 uh, can't be protected by playing e5. To exchange on c3 is not good, since it would lead to white getting total control over the center. Instead, black should play a6, forcing away the white bishop, in this case to f1, followed by knight to c6. White should of course not capture on d4. Instead, Ponomaryov chose to develop his knight by placing it on a3. This was followed by bishop to c5, b4, bishop to a7, rook to b1, and castle kingside. This, the white position here, might seem, well, not maybe not terrible, but weird enough not to be good. A knight on a3 and a pawn on b4 are not typically part of the ideal opening development. Right, but after b5, a takes on b5, knight takes on b5, bishop to c5, bishop to b2, and an exchange on c3, we have reached a position full of possibilities, and the previously odd development has actually become quite comfortable. So, what should you take with you from this game? Well, if you continue on the theme of playing unusual openings, I would say that the most important thing is to find a solid variation and not to de de deviate too far from the most popular lines. But if you choose the slightly less popular moves, you will reach a very different opening than you usually do without losing stability. Of course, we recommend you to go through the entire game as always, but with that, we will end this year's last episode of The Opening School. See you again next year! Then it's finally time for a new chess puzzle after a smaller hiatus in chess tactics. This chess puzzle might actually be not that hard, but just enough to keep your chess tactics going during the December cold until next year. It is a checkmate in three moves and white performs it on black, so good luck finding it. Well, a minute may even be a little bit too much for this puzzle because it was not that complicated, at least that's what I'm hoping. From a material point of view, both parties have the same number of pieces, but from a positional standpoint, we probably have to reevaluate this game. Well, we know there is a checkmate here in three moves, but if we just ignore that small advantage, we can also see that white has three extraordinary active pieces in the center, plus a strong F line with the rook. Black, however, has neither performed a castle king side nor developed the queen or the two knights. So how do we proceed to crush the opponent? Our queen has managed to get in behind the black's front line, awfully close to the black king. We also have a potentially strong bishop diagonal which in combination with the queen definitely could result in a checkmate on, well, perhaps f7. Our knight is however standing in the way of the diagonal, so we realize that we should move it. The question is whether we should start by moving the knight or if we should use it for a cover check. A cover check would surely be in itself become relevant if we played queen f7 and if black captured back. But let's not sacrifice the queen without any further continuation, so we just remove that variation at once. We will actually start to move the knight and so we have two interesting moves that we will take a closer look at. Both are knight checks, namely on c7 and on f6. If we play knight c7 check, we have indeed a checkmate if the king goes to f8, but if the black queen is captured, the knight, 
the settling gets a new escape square, d8. And on a check on f7, he just goes to d8 and we don't have a checkmate in one move. If the knight, however, goes to f6 check, the situation becomes different at once. Black has two options here. He can go to f8 and then we checkmate in just two moves with queen to f7 checkmate. The other option is to capture the checking knight with the pawn on which we respond with queen f7 check. The king can then only go to d7 and then we answer with bishop to d6 checkmate. Well, in the last move, it surely was important not to be too quick and grab the queen to d6. She still had to guard e8. With this little brain exercise, I'll hand over to Professor Arne Johansson, who will tell you about the magazine Harper's Weekly from April the 27th in 1889. Enjoy! In the spring of 2008, I talked about the 6th American Chess Congress that was played in New York in 1889 and mentioned that the very ambitious tournament book lacked pictures of the players. But today I will return briefly to that tournament and to a source with eyewitness reports and pictures of some of the participants. The source in question is the newspaper I hold in my hand here. It was published once a week in New York and has the title Harper's Weekly with the undertitle Journal of Civilization. This issue is from 27th of April 1889 and the first page has an atmosphere from a time very different from today. The contents are mixed and we can find a column called Personal where small and big issues are mixed and where we can read that the Countess Orosi, an Austrian noblewoman, has turned circus manager. And somewhat further down that the Pope is said to be a capital chess player. Further down we read that Carl Benjamin, a Newburyport sailor, who was cast away on one of the Caroline Islands nine years ago, has become king of the island and has 19 wives and 50 children. Well, in the mixed contents, we also find these pages with the Grant relics, with illustrations from an exhibition of Grant's personal belongings. Grant became known for his decisive role in the American Civil War in the early 1860s, and later became the 18th President of the United States. And he died four years before this newspaper was printed. Among the ads in the paper, we can find the eternal theme of weight loss methods. Before we continue with the contents of the newspaper, I would like to say a few words about the Sixth American Chess Congress of 1889. It was one of the really great tournaments of that period, which was one when the interest for chess had grown tremendously after the World Championship match in 1886 between Steinitz and Zuckertot. The world champion meant a lot for the development of chess in the US and was a forceful organizer behind the tournament, but uh, refrained from participating himself. Earlier during 1889, Steinitz had also beaten Chigorin in the world championship match in Havana. The Sixth American Chess Congress was a gigantic double round tournament with 20 participants from both sides of the Atlantic and that lasted for a couple of months. One also had a rather odd rule that if a game had ended in a draw, one had to play an extra game. And it was only if also that game ended in a draw that the players got half a point each. Otherwise, it was the one who won the second game that got the whole point. Since these games were to be played after the last round, it was very difficult to know who actually was in the lead in the tournament. But after all the games were finished, one could note that the victory was shared between Chigorin and the Austrian Max Weiss. 
Gunsby finished third, and the best American was Samuel Lipschitz, who finished in sixth place. Steinitz wrote the sick tournament book, but as I mentioned earlier, it lacked any pictures of the players. But now it's time to return to Harper's Weekly, where we find this page with illustrations of what is said to be the four tournament leaders. From left we see Blackburn, Gunsbury, Weiss and Chigurin. In the accompanying text we read that the first half of the tournament was finished on April 16 and this newspaper appeared nine days later. We can also read that the tournament attracted a large number of spectators and we find short biographies of the four players together with some eyewitness reports from the tournament. We can read that during the tournament the appearance of the four men is very different. Blackburn sits at the table with his hat on and a pipe in his mouth, intently watching the game and pushing his adversary hard. Gunsberg, a light blonde, sits sipping seltzer, is very deliberate in his play and seems to be watching in his antagonist out of the corner of his eye. Chigrin, black-haired, with swarthy skin and bright blue eyes, is much the best-looking man in the room. He drinks coffee and smokes cigars and is somewhat nervous in his manner. Now and again he walks about looking at the other games in progress. Weiss looks like a good-natured German and very unlike a chess player. He appears to be neglectful of the game but woe betide the player who forces him. End of quote there. The report also states that Weiss had a rather dull style, mainly aimed at achieving draws, but it turned out to be effective, while Blackburn took risks and achieved some brilliant games. Well, with this eyewitness report from the Sixth American Chess Congress, we leave Harper's Weekly and end for today, and wish all viewers a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you so much for watching Chess TV. We'd like to take this opportunity to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. See you in 2013. Bye.